say something about, first of all, I would like to say something about the background. And the background is about G, a real reductive B group. Now, of course, if you are not familiar with the field, this doesn't tell you anything. So let me give a, a number of examples. Um, GLNR is an example. Group of invertible n by n matrices, matrices with uh, entries of the reals. SLNR, those matrices with determinate 1. The stabilizer group of an inner product which is indefinite of signature P, comma Q. And we could, for instance, also take the symplectic group of R2n equipped with the standard symplectic form. And there is also, we can also give a characterization of, uh, of, the, of the type of group. Uh, you have basically all representative examples if you assume that G is a subgroup of GLNR. It should be closed. And that implies auto that it is automatically a smooth manifold. Should it stand in front of the blackboard? Is it visible from there? Larger? Just a little larger? I can do that, yes. sure. Um, and um, so this is a condition, and the, and, the, and the other condition is that if, if x is an element of g, then it's transposed to also be an element of g. If you have such a group, then basically you have a real reductive Lie group, and basically all real reductive Lie groups are of this type. That should also require a connection. So. And um, let us fix a subgroup N of G, and this is a maximal unipotent subgroup. Unipotent means that its elements are unipotent, so if you subtract the identity, then you are left with a unipotent matrix. And a typical, typical example in the case of GLNR, one has that N is the group of upper triangular matrices with ones on the diagonal. And um, fix also a group homomorphism from N to a circle group U1. So this is also called the unitary character. And now our object of study will be a space of functions that transform according to that character. Um, so first of all, it can be shown that the group G mod N has a invariant measure. <coughs> Under the action by translations of G. Let's call it Dx. Then we can define an associated space of L2 functions on G mod N. Not really L2 functions of G mod N, but rather sections of the line bundle. And that means that we look at space of functions on G with values in C that have certain transformation behavior under N on the right. Uh, so M of G and G the character at inverse times F of G. And secondly, if you take the absolute value of F, since this is uh, basically an inter is basically a number of the circle, it has absolute value one. So the absolute value becomes an L2 function on G mod N is the requirement. And of course, with respect to that, we very natural. Now we have a group, we have an action of the group on this space. We have a so-called left regular action. If X is an element of G, okay, then we get we have the action on the space of functions by left translation, so that means that the left translate of the function f is f, and then this 
in the symbol which indicates the variable. So I translate the variable by, by x inverse. And so this amounts to, to a translation of f by x. Um, and then, of course, because of invariance of the measure under the action of the group, um, the map Lx from uh, so so we so L is really a map, a group homomorphism from F to the unitary transformations of the space of L two sections of the line bundle determined by phi. And um, it has the right continuity properties, and therefore this is a unitary representation. So a unitary representation is basically a group of G, it's basically a group homomorphism of G into the unitary group of the Hilbert space with certain continuity conditions, which I shall not specify now. Um, and so a unitary representation pi in a Hilbert space, h pi, so a unitary unirec, unitary representation is, is irreducible, is said to be irreducible if it cannot be written as, and this is of course total abusive notation, but I know that you understand what I mean, it cannot be written as a direct sum. So in, in, this means that the, H pi does not decompose in a direct sum of Hilbert spaces which are invariant under the action by pi, and that gives a decomposition of this representation in smaller unitary representations. And then the question is, and let's let G hat, let, be, let this be the notation of all unitary representations, irreducible unitary representations. Unitary representations, and of course we identify irreducible unitary representations that should be considered as the same representations in an obvious manner. Then the question of harmonic analysis, so the problem of harmonic analysis in this setting is to find a decomposition of the left regular representation as a direct integral over irreducible representations with certain multiplicities and a certain measure. And I'm not going to specify what this means, um, but we will specify what it means more or less in a concrete example that we are going to discuss in a moment. And I wanted to give some background here. Attached with this, there should be an isomorphism, F, for Fourier transform. And the idea is that this map should be unitary. And then, of course, this Fourier transform should also relate the action here to a well-defined representation on this direct integral. And so this is the problem of finding a, the so-called whitaker plancherel formula. And the name Whitaker will be explained in the, in the, in the rest of this talk. So let me say a little bit of the history, about the history of this problem. Um, so the Harris Chandra announced, so Harris Chandra is, 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 is the father of representation theory of the inductive group theory. It's, uh, and he announced um, in 1980 that he had a proof of this result. So 1980, Harris Chandra. Announced the precise description. So it announced the above. Precise description, and, uh, he and he gave the precise Fourier transform, and he, and he uh, claimed that he had proven this direct integral decomposition. And unfortunately, the manuscript didn't appear uh, before his death. He, he died in the fall of 1983. Uh, much too young, and uh, so he had no uh, opportunity to, to write down a decent manuscript. 
Fortunately, um, Father Rajan and Kangoli, with the help of uh, Job Cook, um, they went through the Harris manuscripts of Harris Chandra and they came up with a posthumous publication in 1989, uh, 2019. Sorry. So this is, this is posthumous volume 5. And um, was it 2019? I think so. That would be it, right? 2019. Independently, Oh, I should say that I have studied this, uh, this work uh, and I've come to the conclusion that this, the proof is actually not complete. So, Fourier transform, so there is an incompleteness. Okay. Uh, the foot, this isomorphism is only defined on a space of which one can show that it is a closed subspace, but it need not be the entire space. So, Harris Chandler proves a formula on a particular space, but he fails to prove that that space is dense. So, so, so let's, let's say density fails. So the density fails, or he doesn't prove density? He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't prove it. Density not true, because actually the space is, the result is true, but uh, the density was a certain density result was not good. So independently, there was work by uh, by Nolan Wallach in 1992 in his second book on real reductive groups. And Wallach claimed that he had an independent proof, but in 2017, or maybe 16, uh, I found an error, an error in Wallace's work, and this was a very serious error, and I did this together with uh, my former PhD student, Joe Katz. And after that, I started thinking about the subject, and of course I decided to calculate things in the uh, uh, most, in the simplest example that one can imagine, the, the group SL2R, and this is what I, that, that's, uh, calculation, I want to explain that today. Um, and, but in the meantime, I've been able to find a complete proof of this, uh, to, the completion of the proof of this result. So actually, um, I hope to contribute a few times to the Tarticles session <laughs> in the future, if the papers are finished. It's a lot of work, but at some point I hope it will be finished. Okay, let's um, let's look. Let's now concentrate on a particular example. So the example I want to concentrate now on now is this is what I meant by this. Ah, but it's getting better. It's the eraser. It's the eraser, which is the the blackboard was clean, but we forgot the eraser. Sorry about that, folks. At home. <laughs> so the example that I want to consider is the group as on two R. From now on, and in this case, um, M. Actually, I want to write this down here. And N is the group consisting of matrices of the form NY. And NY is the simplest unit quoted matrix one can imagine. This one, where Y is done so it reads. And um, the character chi is, can be given by the character of N. NY goes to E to the I RY where R is a new number. And now I realize that I forgot to say something in my statement of this result. One needs, one needs to require, so provided, the character is regular. And this basically means that it's 
that this kernel that this kernel is as small as possible. And that condition means here that R is different from zero. And in fact, it turns out that if you work with an arbitrary R, then it turns out that you can come back to the situation with R is one half by rescaling. So there is no loss of generality without so no loss of generality we assume that R is half. And in this situation formulas work out most beautifully. Um, another group that I will need is the group A, consisting of the diagonal matrices with positive entries in SO2R. The determinant should be 1, so it can always be written like this. Let's call this AT, where T runs over degrees. And there is another group which I need that is K, which is SO2. So A stands for abelian. M stands for nilpotent, so if the B algebra is nilpotent, K stands for compact, SO2, and SO2 has the following parameterization. K phi is the rotation by angle phi. I think it is a good idea to leave this notation here so that I can refer to it. Or maybe one more, one more thing. <coughs> What I need is notation for the character, the following character of K. Psi L is the character which sets A phi to E to the I L phi. So, um, the first thing that I want, which is very important for the structure. Investigation. L is, L is an integer. Sure. Thank you. Both positive and negative. Um, so one has the following uh, facts, which is actually easy to prove. But as of tomorrow, uh, is can be written as a product K A N. And by this I mean a product of S manifolds. So S manifolds in this K times A times N. And then the map here is the multiplication. So if I have elements of K, A, and N, I multiply them, I get an element of, of, of this, this product, which is and, and which this defines a diffeomorphism to SO2. So that means that um, we know the geometry of SO2R very well, and this is going to be helpful in the continuation of the talk. Because now what I can do is I can look at the space of L2 functions in G and N, um, which transform according to the character that I introduced over there, the character of N, the unitary character. So this basically is Kn. And from this, and K is SO2, so that's basically the circle group. So what I can do now is I can decompose this space according to left transformation behavior, uh, according to characters of the circle group. So this is basically apply the theory of Fourier series, and then we find that this is a direct sum, an orthogonal direct sum over all the characters of K. And I'll write it like this: psi n d mod n by, and the so this reflects transformation behavior on the left and the transformation behavior is that f of k a n or f of k g n is so it consists of L2 functions f and this transformation behavior psi L of k times f of g uh, and times psi n of k. Now Psi and the L2 psi L2 psi n. Yeah. So in our preparation, I first called this n, and then I changed to l. This is never a good idea to do this. <laughs> but, but I did it anyway. Okay. Um, right, and, and of course, since this is of type k a n, this can be identified with L2 functions. 
each of these components can be identified with L2 functions of A, and through the map T goes to A2, this can be identified, group A can be identified with R with the addition at zero as a group. And so then we have all two functions of R, but there is a Jacobian involved, and the Jacobian gets be computed and turns out to be e to the 2t dt. But of course, we don't see the action of the group anymore. We only see the action of A here by translation. Um, this this runs. So now, um, the idea is to fix L and study, study a suitable Fourier transform restricted to this space L2 of psi L, etc. This is the idea. And so we have to build somehow a Fourier transform. Now in the context of representation theory, this is done by taking Unit, unitary representations and suitable unitary representations and taking their matrix coefficients. The matrix coefficients will depend on, will be functions of the group. Um, and the idea is that in this way you can create sort of your exponential functions of the Fourier transform. So I cannot explain how this, uh, how this goes. This is really big group theory and I promised that no knowledge of big group theory would be needed. But, but anyway, we use the so-called principal series of representations by lambda, where lambda runs over the imaginary numbers, and you take matrix coefficients, then one gets certain functions, WH, of course these functions are later related to Whittaker functions, so I have I'm borrowed the name already. They depend on lambda. I want to see them as functions here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the t variable. So that means that the parameter will be parameter t. And this function actually it turns out that this can be defined for lambda in C, and then the behavior of this function is entire homomorphic. And um, it is it is real and it is real. So now in representation theory of semi simple lead groups, one can use differentiations, and in particular one can use invariant differential operators on the Lie group. And what I'm going to, and, and if you take the bi-invariant differential operators on the Lie group, you can show that they act by scalars on irreducible representations. This is basically a manifestation of Schur's law. And we can do this for SL2R by taking the Casimir. Now I'm going to denote the Casimir by delta because you could view it as a kind of Laplacian with, with uh, signature 1,2. So this will be my notation for the Casimir operator. So this is, an, is a, is a bi-invariant second order differential operator on the group G. And there is a natural way to let it act on um, Representations, you can see that it acts by a scalar there. You can calculate the scalar by which the Casimir acts on the principal series representation, and from this one obtains that the Casimir acts on this Whittaker matrix coefficient by the scalar lambda squared minus 1. So this Whittaker function is an eigenfunction of a very natural differential operator which you need from the group. And what I want to do is investigate the space which arises is that if I fix the behavior of the left uh, under K uh, by the character psi L, so 
let's fix L and study what happens on that particular subspace. And then the observation is that if we look at the space of smooth functions on, uh, with the transformation behavior just mentioned, uh, I, so the smooth function with the transformation behavior that we introduced, then the Casimir operator leaves this space invariant. It's by invariant, so the behavior on the, on the right and on the left is preserved, and therefore the Casimir operator <coughs> preserves this space. On the other hand, this space is as a manifold, it is k times, or, since we are working with behavior under k and we are working with behavior under m, we are basically left with a one parameter space, the space a. So you can identify this with smooth functions in A or R in the T variable. And then this Casimir operator becomes, leaves this space invariant and becomes a differential operator here, which I will call the L radial part of the Casimir operator. And let me give the formula. Sure. So The Casimir acts only on the T. Right. Yeah. The lambda is a spectral variable, and the T is this variable of the differential equation. Yes. So if I want to make a connection to Laplacians, do you have also some kind of notion of boundary? So if you, for example, look at T in a certain um, domain, like not the whole R, but like a certain domain, then does it make sense to specify, for example, how the Casimir acts uh, on a certain point for T fixed? Um, or you don't really actually, you can do that. Um, you can use the Poincaré disk, which has an action of SL2 R by a linear, fractional linear transformations, mm -hmm. and which is isomorphic to SL2 R modulo, modulo K. So you can have the Casimir acting there, and then it turns out to be the usual Laplacian times a factor which reflects the hyperbolic matrix. Ah. And then you can do a boundary value. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And if you want to do the other K types, then you have to look at uh, line boundaries. Okay. And then you can do the similar thing. Okay. So, what is the operator that one gets? Delta L is, let me also write it down here. This operator is, is radial part delta L. The given is the following second order differential operator. Plus, uh, we need my notes for this, 2 times dgt uh, minus 2l e to the minus 2t minus e to the minus 4t. And so here t runs over of, 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 of new numbers. And now we can do a substitution of variables. The e to the 2t will be the name, will be. So we will introduce a new variable z, which is related to t by being e to the 2t. So this is an element of zero infinity. And then the differential, the differential operator in this new coordinate z becomes. So if I work in the t, I will omit the tilde. If I work with the z variable, I will, will keep the tilde. So this will be my convention from now on. And this operator now becomes 4 z squared. And then the 2 is squared minus 2L, this was the K time, Z plus Z squared. And this is this turns out four times the classical Whitaker operator. Let me write it down like this, with parameters minus L over 2 comma lambda. So if you look at the eigen equation for this operator, uh, the eigen equation of, of, of this form, let's, let's call the function W, the Whitaker function, then um, maybe I should say immediately that if I take the Whitaker function that I have defined and now view it as a function in the t variable, then if I apply this 
this operator to it, then it will be lambda squared minus 1 times the root of the function, which I introduced as a matrix coefficient, expressed in the t form. So it's the restriction to a, the root of the function. And then this is the classical Whittaker equation. Now the Whittaker equation can be viewed as a differential equation on the Riemann sphere, and then it has two singularities. Uh, one of them at zero is a regular singularity, so we can apply the theory of initial exponents there. And another singularity is at infinity, but there the singularity is irregular. And the reason for this is that it is really a limit situation of a hypergeometric differential equation with three singularities on the Riemann sphere, and then what you can do is you can make the uh, two singularities go together at infinity, and then you get an irregular singularity. So this is the reason also for studying this equation classically. Okay. So as I said already, this, this, this has a regular singularity. Regular singularity at zero, and it has an irregular Singularity at infinity. Now, usually it's very difficult to describe a solution in the neighborhood of an irregular singularity, but the Whittaker function is completely no how it behaves. And the behavior is rather wild. So, the timeline is still in change. How am I doing sweater wise? Say very badly. <laughs> Actually, before I started with this talk, I made sure that I emptied my pockets. <laughs> this is also something that my wife taught me. She's completely right, of course, and I will. I hope to that she will listen to this talk right there, <laughs> and then be proud of me. <laughs> sure. So you said that's real dimension two. That's right. Sure, what I'm doing, of course, what I what what I'm doing, what 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 happens is that I I will take a certain I will take certain branches of the root of the function, the solutions of this equation over the positive real numbers. That's what happens. So it's basically what I do is holomorphically extend. The differential equation. And then its solutions will be, become uh, multi valued homomorphic functions, which can be restricted to the real line, and then become real line solutions to this particular differential equation. Just in general, for Sure. For, should be, well, yeah, for, but yeah, I switch it's between them. It's also real. But, but if you do analytic continuation, you will enter this, the theory of Whittaker functions, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so um, now classical facts. Is that the um, Whittaker equation has a basis of solutions um, w h plus minus lambda of z, where now z runs over, so I only look at branches over the positive real numbers, um, which are uniquely determined by their asymptotic behavior towards infinity. And the plus function has a following asymptotic behavior. It behaves like e to the z over t exponentially times c to the minus l over 2. And there is also the negative one. It behaves negative exponentially for 0 to plus infinity. And then the factor is minus c to the l over 2. 
So every other solution of the Whittaker equation over this positive real line can be written as a linear combination of these. And that means that generically a solution to the Whittaker equation will always have exponential behavior towards infinity. Except if you, if you take the coefficient of this element to be zero and you concentrate on this one, then you have a function which has moderate behavior towards infinity. And in fact has very fast decay towards infinity. And now the miracle is, lemma, that the Whittaker function that we found and that we decided to view as a function of z now, the Whittaker function that we found as a matrix coefficient is a multiple of the Whittaker function of moderate behavior. And so what one would say is that somehow representation theory manages to pick out um, the, the, the moderate solution. So representation theory gives, or the rapidly decreasing solution, how about one could also say. So picks moderate solution. And this is true for the whole, for, for every group, this is true. So there will, there will always be irregular singularities and representation theory will always pick out, so this is really a miracle that this happened, will always pick out um, a well-behaved, a function which is well-behaved at infinity. Now, there is another classical fact, which is easy to verify. If you look at the Whittaker differential equation at zero, it has a record singularity there, so that means that the theory of initial indices is applicable. And the initial indices are indices at zero are uh, plus or minus lambda over, over two minus r. So that means that um, you can so so what now follows from the theory of of regular singularities, it follows that there is a uh, that there is a so there exists a power series phi of lambda uh, for z is of the form y plus and then so the powers with coefficients in the class of lambda. So one is I choose one in order to normalize things. So there exists such a function, which is a power series in Z. Radius of convergence is in fact infinity. And um, it, is de it depends very on lambda, lambda over C. And such that um, both Z to the lambda minus a half times phi of lambda times Z and Z together with c to the minus lambda minus a half times phi of lambda comma z. Minus lambda comma z form a basis of solutions. And that means that the solution that we have found is, can be written as a linear combination of these basic solutions. By the way, I don't want to carry along this minus a half over time, so let's call this psi, and this is psi in the tilde situation, maybe I should have put a tilde here too, uh, of, uh, of lambda comma z, and this function is going to be called psi. Uh, so this is then automatically psi of minus lambda comma z. And now what one knows is that the, what one can deduce from this is that the Whittaker function that we constructed can be written, the one with that moderate behavior towards uh, infinity, can be written as a linear combination of these two, these former cases, with coefficients that depend on the parameter lambda in a near morphic way. So, um, oh, I was, I was there for the eraser again, I forgot. Thank you.
Sure. Uh, so loudly, please. Hmm? Loudly, please. Loudly, because the eraser makes noise. <laughs> okay. So, uh, if you write this coefficient that you can see it as much. Right. Yeah. It's gamma k. Does this mean that it is related to the gamma function? Sure, sure. The coefficients will be exp are expressible in terms of gamma functions. So, uh, so what we have is now a corollary that the Whitaker function, and now I lift everything to the original situation, can be written as a coefficient c plus lambda times psi lambda plus c minus lambda times psi. Minus so here I have omitted the z variable, but this is a function of, oh, oh sorry, the t variable, this is a function of t, this is a function of t, and this is a function of t, and these coefficients are mirror morphic. These are mirror morphic functions and c. Now, first remarkable fact, maybe, maybe this fact is not so remarkable yet, but it is a, it is a manifestation of a, of a general theorem of Harris Chandler, and that is that if lambda is imaginary, by the way, imaginary values of lambda correspond to the principal series that are unitary. So they are supposed to show up in the Fourier transform. And if you have this, then it turns out that the absolute value of C plus lambda is the absolute value of C minus lambda. <coughs> and so since this function basically behaves, so let me, let me first. first of all, these C functions are, um, that this is the, co the, the coefficients you asked me about. And this C function actually is expressible in terms of gamma functions. And of this function, I'm not completely sure, but I, 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 I vaguely remember that it is also expressible in terms of gamma functions. For lambda imaginary, one has, so this is where we should look for this, the, the spectral value of our Fourier transform. One has this property. And um, we should. So this means that the Whittaker function, if I multiply the Whittaker function with e to the t, and I take the Whittaker function with lambda and t, for lambda imaginary, then this behaves like, and I would like to write it like this, s carries over plus or minus 1, and then I take the c function corresponding to s. So this is what Harris general calls the c function, e to the S lambda t. Those familiar with E theory may read this as spiegeling. This is really the wild group that is appearing here. Um, for lambda, lambda, lambda. So um, that means so. So we define the psi function as this one, z to the lambda minus a half times phi, but z was e to the, and I think I forgot the half lambda here. Uh, z was e to the t of t, so if I take e to the e two, e two, if I, if I take e to the t two, two t to this exponent, then I get e to the lambda t minus t, and I have put the e to the t in front, and I'm left with this. So, but here lambda is imaginary. So these are these are functions. These are basically plane waves. So that means that in, that this function is basically asymptotically it behaves like a sum of two plane waves, and each of the frequencies is represented with the same energy, given all the absolute value of the c function. So it looks like some scattering property is in the background here. And in other similar situations, people have shown that this is indeed a scattering phenomenon. 
it appears all over harmonic analysis, these mass cell deprivations appear all over harmonic analysis on real reductive groups, and they are very important for the determination of the pleasure outcome. So that's why I'm putting so much emphasis on this. And you will see where this plays a role here. Um, so this width of function is neuromorphic. It's, um, oh no, sorry, it was holomorphic. What I actually want to do is I want to do a renormalization of this function, this Wittgen function, and the renormalization, renormalize, is going to be indicated by a, by a circle. What do I want to do? I want to re take the renormalization re which I get by multiplying with the first, the plus C function inverse. So as a result, one gets that one can use the decomposition of that with the function over there in terms of the same basis, and then one gets normalized C functions. And this normalized C function is one, and this normalized C function has absolute value equal to one because of the mass cell. Actually, this absolute value being 1 can be expressed, for, so this is for imaginary lambda, but this can be expressed in a holomorphic way, so to say. Um, imaginary, this absolute value is 1 is the same as if you multiply the C function with, with itself, Conjugates, then you get the absolute value, which is 1. But this is true, this is a non holomorphic expression because of the conjugate here. But if I take a conjugate over lambda here with a minus, then I keep the same thing on the imaginary numbers. But now I have a holomorphic expression in lambda. So by analytic continuation, this is true for all lambda in C. And this is actually something that we need. So now, I'm ready to define my Fourier transform. Oh. I thought I was smart, putting the eraser here, but then I forgot. So, definition, we define the Fourier transform as a transform from a smooth, compactly supported function on A, or rather R, the T variable, to neuromorphic functions on C by, uh, if I take a function, then its Fourier transform is given by integrating over R, the function, Using the Jacobian e to the 2t, or oh, this should be e to the t. Sorry about that. e to the. No, e to the 2t. Sorry. e to the 2t. This was correct. Times. So the idea is to take the width of a function as my exponential function, but then of course there should be a conjugate of it, then I have something that is not holomorphic anymore in lambda or meromorphic anymore in lambda, but I can modify the lambda in this way so that it is the same for imaginary lambda, and now this is, this is meromorphic in lambda. So what I do is I test the function f with the Whitaker function, and I'm left with a meromorphic function in the spectral variable, like one would do with ordinary Fourier transform. And then there is also a candidate for the inverse transform. And this is basically what I would like to call the adjoint Fourier transform. And this is given by, by the way, I forgot to say that one can show that actually um, the Fourier transform of a smooth, 
of a smooth compactly supported function as a function on, on IR, it's actually a function of the source space. So where this is should be considered as one dimensional real vector space in the one of the source space the functions that are rapidly decreasing in angular derivatives. Um, and then the, the joint Fourier transform or the conjugate Fourier transform can be defined in this way. It's an operator in, it, in the other direction. And then this, the, the definition is that if I have a function in the Schwartz space here, psi, then the Fourier transform is going to, is, the joint Fourier transform gives me a function in T, which is given by taking the superposition against the back measure, the back measure of IR viewed as a one dimensional real linear space, and then um, psi lambda functions as an amplitude and one takes the superposition of the width of the function. So to normalize the And the idea of normalizing is that if you, if I hadn't normalized, I would have, I would have to make the measure non-trivial to compensate for that. And the reason for normalizing is that in the end, it turns out that this is the right measure that we, that we take. Okay. So now, the hope is. The composition of these two is the identity. Actually, this is not the hope, because if this were true, then the principal series would carry the entire Plancherel formula, Ritzker Plancherel formula, which we know is not true. So this should better be different from the identity, but in some sense, in some sense, this should be true. And actually, it turns out that it is true in the following sense. Um, first of all, I need the following thing. I want to formulate the theorem. Uh, theorem. Theorem. There exists a real analytic differential operator on R. So maybe I should say C over that for real analytic. A real analytic differential operator on R. Linear differential operator on R with constant top order term, constant coefficient, constant coefficient top order term, such that um, For all smooth functions with complex support, one has that if you apply the free transform and transform back by the adjoint transform, then, it, then this differential operator should have the name D sub R, and the R starts, stands for regularizing. So I will show in a minute what, what I mean by this. The DR of this. So the idea is that I'm going to kill the difference of this composition I by the differential operator. So that I that I annihilate lower dimensional spectrum. And the theory is that this is equal to dr times t psi of f, where t psi of f In, in T is given by a complex line in the this one. So I translate the imaginary axis by a real variable psi, and then it should be two times, these will become clear in the long tunnel, and over that lambda, and then this function psi. This Whittaker this function which satisfies the Whittaker differential equation that enters as well as components over here of the decomposition of the Whittaker function in the psi lambda and the psi minus lambda. Somehow the psi minus lambda appears here. What really happens is that it is absorbed in this expression and this 
it implies the, the, uh, the coefficient 2. And this is, so the idea is that we have pi r here. One can show that there are certain similarities that have to be cancelled of a negative real line, finitely many. And um, the idea is then that one shifts over a positive real number, which is sufficiently big, so that we get the integral over this line, and integrating over this minus pi, integrating over this line, defines this, what I'll call pseudo independent t of f. So the theorem is that basically this is not the identity, but it is this wave pattern, pseudo wave pattern, t psi of f modulo the kernel of this differential operator. And now, from the end of the story, and the end of the story is that I cannot, that I can only give one proof. Oh, this trick turns out to be done. Where was I? Here? Um, right. Once you have that formula, and this requires a proof, um, which I will not, which I will not give. And then, first corollary of this result is that actually, if you apply dr to the conjugate Fourier transform composed with the Fourier transform then this is the same as dr. So in other words, this is the same as dr on t psi. So this is rather surprising. Secondly, but it shows that actually our hope comes true a little bit, because modulo the kernel of dr, we indeed have that the conjugate uh, Fourier transform composed with f gives the identity, modulo the kernel of dr. And then, secondly, T psi is actually the identity of the space of smooth functions with complex support with both these and R. And this turns out to be a very important consequence. And I'll explain in a moment. And corollary three, once we have that, what we can do is, so we have we represent f by an integral over a shifted line. And the idea is that then we shift it back, and then we pick up residues, and then but and then we get we actually we get our function f. So we get then we get the integral over over, uh, over this line, which turns out to be which can be rewritten as the interval over there. And, the, and this then gives a formula that, that, that this is indeed an inversion modulo a finite sum over a, singular, over a set of singularities phi 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 2 for the phi 4 for the, for the 2 that was appearing, and then the residue in the lambda is mu. Mu S is this set of singularities, and then uh, the expression F F lambda psi of lambda. Um, and so then in representation theory, this can be worked out in, in detail, but then one has singularities along hyperplanes. So there is a residue calculus of a hyperplane configuration coming in. One can organize all the, these residues, and then this accounts for the contributions of all the representations of the generalized principle series and the discrete series. Um, for, so that means that this then is the part of the batch relative that comes from the principle series. And for SL2R, this part comes from the discrete series of representations. 
And the fact that we have this inversion formula on arbitrary smooth compactly supported functions, this space is certainly dense in the L2 space that we are interested in. So this solves the problem. This solves the incompleteness in Harris Chandler's rule. Now, it's time, so I have to stop. Um, but I would, I would like to invite everyone to indicate, to let me in, indicate the proof of corollary too. <laughs> but first I'll stop. Thank you. We have questions. Um, so they define the Fourier transform on the smooth, compact, important functions. Right. But could you also do it on the on space of smart function? Absolutely, this can be done. There is a good candidate for the space of Schwartz functions, but then, of course, one has to one has one has to adapt the definition of Schwartz functions to the Whittaker space. So the space of Schwartz functions for the Whittaker space, for the Whittaker for the Whittaker rational formula, Schwartz functions are functions on R. Let's write script C of R, and this is usual Schwartz. This is the usual Schwartz behavior. More or less usual Schwartz uh, towards infinity. So this is the, this is, and then there is that there is it's very rapid behavior, faster than any exponential towards minus infinity. So faster than e to the minus mt for all for all n. And then uh, such a condition should also be put on the, on the derivative. But then one has a short space, and then one can show actually that the Fourier transform is actually continuous linear endomorphism, uh, a continuous linear isomorphism from this short space to the short space space on IR, the usual short space on IR. So this is possible. And then in terms the it turns out that the joint Fourier transform is actually um, is also a topological isomorphism from now this, the usual Schwartz space to the Whittaker Schwartz space. Yeah. By the way, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, then I'm not answering the question, but making a proper thing. Uh, <laughs> so, what was the meaning for Fourier two? For ah, so so let me. Briefly indicate how we <laughs> Yes. Before the name of question, because the theorem to me looks interesting. It does it interesting as more as we know or we are. And I'm also wondering, can you find the proof of the only two without giving us more information about we are? You have to be here. Oh, I'm sorry, DR. Yeah, sure. DR is very explicitly. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Thank you for this question. DR is defined as a product, um, so it should have a regularizing function. So the problem with, so one studies this integral when psi varies, but you have to apply the differential operator to make the shift to pi r in order to connect with the composition of the two maps. You have to connect this to, to F check composed with F by shifting psi to, to uh, psi to zero. But that means that you then meet this set of singularities S and you will pick up residues. And at first we don't want to do that. At first we don't want to pick up anything in order to be able to prove corollary to it. And so what we do is we take a differential operator which makes sure that it annihilates these contributions. So what we do, we take dr is product over um, mu in the set of singularities. And then we take the radial component of the Casimir operator and we subtract the eigenvalue in mu so that this operator will be zero at that will produce zero on this function in T at that particular point mu, and we do this to the order which is high enough. So this is the operator that we take. 
So it is just, it regularizes in the sense that it regularizes this function along the path, the, along the shift. Other questions? I still didn't give the proof of probability two. But maybe I can ask a general one. So um, I understood right. So your objects you're dealing with make different matrices, and you want to do.